All right, this is my entry into one Zangelique good old gear uh, contest entry, and it's the what do you think is the greatest comic book ever made? And it was amazing because like this is one of those little contests I would have had an entry in way before, but uh, first of all, in his video, he named his favorite uh, what he thought was the greatest comic book ever. It was Fantastic Four, 48, 49, and 50, The Coming of Galactus, which, like, the first thing that popped in my head, okay? Then I was like, well, he named that. I don't want to do that. And then I was sitting there thinking, okay, Watchmen number two right here, okay? And I've already talked about Watchmen in other videos, and I, this is, I'll put this in number one of my top ten comics, you know, of all time, I guess, for me or something. And, of course, you know, if I get on the Watchmen kick, I'm going to be on the Watchmen kick, and I'm, I think I've said a whole lot as it is about that. Then I got on here and I was getting ready to shoot a video and I just happened to pop on YouTube to get things ready and right when I popped on, Constant Bromstar was uh, doing a live podcast, go check it out, broadcast, you know, through Google Plus and he's like, I think he was like 30 seconds into it and he named Commandy number one, you know, he named Commandy and he even gave some reasons, you know, that match mine about liking the book and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. All right, so I'm like, okay, just commit, man, just commit. Don't be ashamed. Go up there, pick a book, pick a book. So, uh, you know, the greatest comic book of all time for me has got to be Spawn Batman by Todd McFarlane from the 90s. You know, we were wanting Spider-Man, you know, in Spawn to meet up with Todd McFarlane, you know, drawing it, possibly writing with, you know, one of the Spider-Man writers, you know, Dave Nickelney. Maybe he can get back with him or something like that and you know we were wrong how stupid were we man of course it was supposed to be spawn in batman and i mean and and batman has this classic we're going to say punk about 30 times per page i mean really i mean how many times can you call al you know simmons a punk and it, it just never gets old i'm joking you actually seriously you know this is the one this is the greatest comic book of all time death mate red all right i mean the weight we had we had with this for Liefeld to get in here, man. And you know what? You figured this book wouldn't have been as late as it was, considering that you know the shortcuts he takes of you know you know blessing us without having to see feet and stuff. But I think all the extra pouches and all the extra guns and I mean he actually took the time to try to draw some feet and stuff. So I think that slowed down the book a whole a long time. And let's face it, man, we need our Liefeld art, you know. And nah, I'm joking with you again. I'm gonna go back with my. The first thing that really popped in my head, <coughs> and get serious here for a minute, but it's a trade of it. It's the uh, coming of Galactus story from Fantastic Four, uh, 48, 49, and 50. And, uh, you know, it is one of the greatest stories ever. And I think, considering this came out in the 60s, the reason I consider it probably one of the greatest is, if not, you know, the greatest stories, because number one, Fantastic Four was, um, you know, coming up on its 50th issue, and it had the same creative team, and they'd done so much stuff, and Kirby's art evolved so much, and they did this so much with these characters, you know, it's it's actually that Kirby Stan Lee run is probably the greatest run in comics, you know, with the same creative team, and just everything they put in there just never got old, I mean, it was just so rich, and it had momentum, and you kept feeling like it was moving and stuff. And you gotta understand, they had the Comic Code Authority back then. Now, first of all, this is where just you know Jack Kirby come, goes to town, and we get the we, we get to see you know the Silver Surfer debut, you know just a great character, just so out there. And basically, what's going on is that it has the feeling of Judgment Day coming. We have fire across the sky, and then there are rocks across the sky, and you kind of find out that uh, you know. People in New York are reacting like this at the end of the world. It's Judgment Day to me. And the Fantastic Four are on it. They're just on it, man. And the Watcher appears as an omen of something that's coming that's deadly serious. And, you know, Kirby gets in there and he does some great collage work in there in a comic book. Kirby, every now and then, would throw out collage work where he would take old magazines and find pictures in them and paste them up and stuff and make artwork out of it. So, I mean, this thing was just so rich and everything that was going on. And another thing is that there was never really a story like this, okay? And there was characters in this that have never really been there. I mean, to me, it's one of those things like you really didn't know what was going to happen and what was next. And all of a sudden, you see the debut of Galactus after getting hit with the Silver Surfer. Now, 
this this comic is coming up you know it's it's closer to 50 years old than it is anything else and we've seen galactus and we've seen the silver surfer and you got to put your mind back there where you never saw anything like this kirby was hitting with a one-two punch but as hard as i am on stan lee for being in the office at the right time and being a great spokesman and having a philosophy that if you come up with an idea it's your idea you create it and stuff kirby was supposedly working a lot at home to the point that he was really moving this plot in this book along and stuff but what happens is what happens is what great english that is uh but what it is about this book that really makes me really forgiving of stan lee is that for some reason he was able to take a hold of that silver surfer and put a voice in him that waxes philosophical it's almost preachy it's uh poetic um he really found a character where stan lee the writer was coming through i have never claimed that stan lee is not a great light uh writer okay or anything like that but for some reason to me he found a muse in this silver surfer character and he went on with him and it's one of the few things you can go on and see that kirby wrote without that stan lee wrote that kirby wasn't there where you were still hearing his voice you know i mean so you know basically it kind of brought out something and from my point of view of stan lee to write there and stuff right now then we had some just great splash pages and some just great kirby art you know and i think joe sennett is the one inking on, inking on this and it was just popping. The colors were popping, even in the four-color world back then. And, you know, we get into the, 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 we're looking at humanity here, right? I've read articles before where someone had said that Jack Kirby had actually read the Bible and flipped through it and stuff, you know. And when he read about God, the vision that he got was of Galactus. There's even a G on him. And they kind of went <clears throat> really deep with the religious aspect of it, something I don't think had been in comics before that I have really ran across. Could be wrong, you know, don't get me wrong. And they were comparing Silver Surfer to Jesus because he ends up sacrificing himself for humanity and gets trapped on Earth. And, you know, Galactus would be God because he's here to cleanse the Earth, more or less. He's there to eat the Earth. I mean, he's eating the world. It's going to kill all humanity, but it's it's right up there with Noah. And I believe, you know, God said the next time that he clean, he will never flood the earth again, but he'll use fire to cleanse the earth next time. And that was kind of in there. So basically, underneath the comics code, underneath this four-color world, and back when, you know, they were, they were realizing the comics just weren't for kids. It was for college kids, too. It was a bit more of a sophisticated story. They snuck in some religious aspects in here, okay? They snuck in these characters that and it just, you know, it's kind of one of those things I think after somebody tells you, it's a kick in the head like, why didn't I see it? But the thing about it is that something always bothered me over the years of reading this of, um, you know, comparing uh, Silver Surfer to Jesus. And I started reading it again, and he was trapped on Earth. He was denied the heavens by Galactus. Galactus put to punish Silver Surfer for turning against him, you know, who would be some, you know, Kirby's version of God. He turned around and he trapped him on Earth. He can't fly through space in the heavens again, which is what he's built for, okay? And he's trapped on Earth, and he's an outcast. He's an outsider. And he catches himself doing things to where, like, when people throw trash at him and anytime he retaliated he would sit there and he'd be like oh my god i'm no better than them it's like all of a sudden he was becoming more pure and finding his humanity again they got started with alicia masters when you read the story and then it dawned on me i don't think silver surfer is a jesus christ figure i think he is a lucifer morningstar figure he's the angel that fell you know and he got trapped and cannot return to the heavens okay um, you know, pretty heavy stuff when you just get in there and, you know, you see great big huge images like that. And then the ending of it, you know, oh my god. Basically what the story is, is that this is man versus god, is what's happened. The Fantastic Four are great explorers, are great, you know, people of humanity. And, and you got the thing who's a monster, and, you know, a man trapped in a monster body. And, you know, they had titles and things like this man, this monster and stuff come along and stuff. And I think what they've ended up saying that, you know, you know, it ends up being man versus God. And just 
every page is just art. I mean, you can sit there and just look at it, and it comes with a bang, and you never knew how this thing was going to end. That's what got me. What is the big ending going to be? And it ends up being with a weapon called the Ultimate Nullifier, which made um, Galactus shake. And I've always kind of wondered, there it is, with Reed Richards with the Ultimate Nullifier. And I've always wondered, what did that symbolize? What does that symbolize? Is it the killing of faith? Is that what the Ultimate Nullifier does? I mean, it, you know, they never really, they just say that you blink out of existence, like as if you never really existed, if I'm remembering right and stuff. So what was the ultimate nullifier, you know, symbolizing, okay? That's a big question. And I think it's just one of those books that you can read as a superhero story, a science fiction story, or you can get in there and start getting real philosophical with what were they trying to say here, what, what, you know, and they snuck it all in. This thing even made it to a cartoon in the 60s, uh, a cartoon in the 90s, which just amazes me if people dug deeper, you know, would they have been really upset at the time, you know, when it came out, if they figured, you know, realized what was getting told here? All right, well, anyway, that's my entry. Thanks for having the great contest, Gare. And, uh, yeah, you know, great minds think alike. You, me, Constant Bromstar, what can I say? All right, later, guys.